Dr. Lahab, you have a lot of information in your programs about her. I won't repeat any of that. She's obviously a superstar. Um, but she also comes to us very naturally for another reason. She is known not only for the um, profound impact of her work and significance of her work, she's also known as being a great mentor. So for this luncheon and for the Women in Science Committee, we thought that it was very important to have somebody who embodies those kinds of values in the community of really promoting the next generation of women. And she is known for doing that. She's written about that. Um, but on the ground, she's really a great mentor. So without further ado, Dr. Lahav. Thank you, Susan, for the wonderful uh, introduction. I'm really um, delighted to be here. Um, first of all, I'm uh, very excited to meet uh, so many fascinating women um, in this uh, luncheon. And I'm very excited to share with you um, our work, our research work in the last several years. And then at the end, to tell you a little bit about my career path and how I got to um, what I'm doing right now. Um, I'm going to tell you today about what cancer cells don't want us to know. And um, as you all probably know, you know, cancer, it's a complicated disease. It touches us all. The research that we are doing is what's called basic research to understand the molecular events that lead to cancer and the molecular events that happen when we try to treat cancer. So what is cancer at the molecular level? Cancer begins when cells in part of our body start to grow out of control. In our body, there's always a control on, on how fast cells are going. And in cancer, cells are trying to grow faster and faster and faster. Why this is happening? Cells become cancer cells because of damage to the DNA. And the important thing to remember is our DNA is being damaged all the time. So when you're sitting now with the audience and listening, right now, in some cells in your body, your DNA is being damaged, there are breaks. This is very natural. This is happening spontaneously. But the good thing is that we have their, uh, uh, their mechanism that have evolved to repair those breaks and to make sure that cells are healthy and keep growing. In some cases, with aging or in certain, in, under certain genetic backgrounds, the breaks are not repaired. They can accumulate, lead to mutations, and by this lead to uncontrolled growth of the cells and to later develop into tumors. And so the way I like to think about cancer cells, I like to think about them as like criminals. Criminals that have secrets and they're trying to escape with these secrets. In our ability as researchers, as the detective, to spy on them and to learn about them depends on how we're looking at them, how we are studying them. And there are many ways in how one can study cancer. Um, but there are two main approaches that I would like to convince you today that are especially important when trying to understand you know, basic mechanism leading to cancer. So let me first introduce the two main principles, and then we'll go into each one of them and try and understand why is it so important. First of all, we need to look at individual cancer cell. We need to look at the behavior of each and every cancer cell in a tumor or in a dish that in which we're studying cancer. And the second is we need to measure their behavior over time. We need to see the development, the dynamics of their behavior over time. Let's start with the first principle. We need to look at individual cancer cell. And I want to start with just giving a, like a general example, okay? Imagine that I ask you to um, calculate the average height of everyone in this room, right? What will you do? You'll go and you'll measure each individual, and then you'll get the average. You'll get a number that represents the different heights of the women in this room. Then that's a meaningful number, right? You can also get standard deviation or distribution, and it means something. Now imagine that I ask you another question, and I kind of realize that the second question doesn't make a lot of sense with this audience, but usually when I have a more heterogeneous mixed audience, the question is, 
whatever is the gender in the room. <laughs> well, in most cases, when we have a mix of male and female, um, a gender is it's a binary property, right? You're either male or female. If you average, if you give some kind of average, it doesn't make sense. Even for this audience, right? If we average the gender, we miss Richard. We miss uh, the boy over there, right? So it, it doesn't, we get a number that doesn't make sense, that doesn't tell us anything about the individual. And the important thing to remember is that most studies, most biological studies, and many studies related to cancer, they measure things, they measure the collective behaviors of cells. They don't even get the height of each individual and then calculate the average. They get a single number of how the whole population of cells behave. And this is dangerous. And let me show you why this is dangerous when we're dealing with, cancer, with studies related to cancer. So imagine that I have three, uh, that I have a tumor or I have uh, cancer cells in a dish. And I wanna study how these cancer cells respond to three drugs. These are new drugs and we're trying to understand how they respond, okay? And, I'm, and we're putting here different colors. The yellow represent the cells before we added the drug and the more they respond to the drug, then become more like orange and then red, okay? So we're giving these three drugs, drug one, drug two, and drug three. And then we're looking at the collective behaviors of the cells. And we realize, we're finding, that in response to these three drugs, we always get an intermediate response. The response is what we call orange. It's the same. In all cases, the collective behaviors of the cell give us the orange color. So we may conclude that all these three drugs have similar mechanism of actions. They do the same thing to those cells. But this can be misleading. Because if we have the right lens, the right tools, to look at actually and measure the individual behavior of the cells in this dish or in this tumor, we may realize that the three drugs act very differently. Here are three examples. Perhaps drug number one really, indeed, led to an intermediate response in all the cells. So the average represented the right behavior of all the cells. But for example, drug number two most cells responded, but there is a small, and it can be a very small percentage of cells that are resistant, that are not responding to the drug. And this represents a very ch a big challenge in cancer treatment called fractional killing. When a drug is given to a patient, and it seems as the tumor shrinks and the treatment is successful, but then a small, a very small percentage of the cells survive the treatment, they are resistant, and can be 0.00 something, and these very small number of cells can then grow and become into new tumors. So if we look at the average behavior, we miss those cells. And let's go to even a more extreme case. Imagine that actually you have half of the cells responding and half of the cells are not responding. This is like the gender example. It's either zero or one. It's a binary property. On average, it seems like all the cells have an intermediate response, but actually none of the cells have an intermediate response. It's either a full response or no response. And then again, the average can't be misleading. So I think this convinced, I think hopefully convinced you that we need to look at individual cancer cells, and I'll show you at the second part examples from our studies how we're doing that. But first I wanna move into the second principle. We need to measure their behavior over time. Why this is important. Let me start again with a general example, okay? <clears throat> I have twins. I have uh, um, six years old twins, a boy and a girl. And um, many people come to me and they ask me, do they get along? Are they good friends with each other? And imagine that I ask you to help me answer this question just by showing you one snapshot from their life, okay? And that's the snapshot. <laughs> So you look at this picture and you think to yourself, oh, they look like such good friends, like they're kissing and loving. I bet they will just get along all the time. <laughs> but now imagine that I'm going to show you the sequence. I'm going to show you the sequence of events that happened right after I've taken this picture. <laughs> so first of all, he yelled at her. And then there were some pushing. And at this point, I really I had to drop the camera and to stop the fight. 
Well, actually, to, to be honest, there was one more picture that I decided not to show in case there's a social worker in the audience. <laughs> But in, in, in any case, the point of this simple example from, and that I bet uh, many of you can relate to, is that a snapshot can be misleading. If you look at pictures of kids playing with each other, or if you look at cells, if you look at a tumor responding to a drug, and all you get is one snapshot of the behavior, that can be misleading, and that could lead to some wrong conclusion that could lead later to wrong clinical decisions. Let's go back to the example that we had before, the three drugs, the drug one, two, three. We're looking at individual cells, but we're looking at two snapshots. One, before we added the drug, and second is after we added the drug. And in all three cases, we see that all cells, all cells in this particular cancer line, fully responded to the drug, wonderful. But the problem is that we looked only at the final outcome, at the final result. Now, if we have the ability to measure the dynamics of the response, to see how the response changes over time, we may see that actually the three drugs are very different. Let's see, for example, drug one leads to what we call a gradual change in all the cells. So all the cells together, they respond a little bit and then more and then eventually we get a full response. That's one way that we can get to this uh, outcome. The second way is very different. We're going back into the, the binary idea, right? Cells switch from not responding at all into a full response, and within time, it's not that the respond increases, but the number of responding cells increases. The outcome is the same, but the, but the way to get there is very different. And the third example is even more extreme. If the outcome that we are measuring is not, for example, cell death, but it's something reversible, like a gene that is induced or uh, cells that are moving um, in the dish, then it, there are cases in which we get a response and then the response go away and then we get the response again. These are called like oscillations. And we see it many times in biology. And so again, if we just take one snapshot of the behavior, the outcomes in response to all these three drugs seem exactly the same, but we are able to measure the process in which cells got there we realize that the, it's very different between the three drugs, and that's extremely important to understand what happens so that there are many cases that we, even drugs that are used in the clinic, we don't really understand why they're working or why sometimes they're working and sometimes they're not working. So we have to have this very basic fundamental understanding of how these drugs work so that we can develop better and more efficient drugs that will eventually and hopefully kill all cancer cells. So that's our goal, right? We want to look at individual cancer cells and we want to follow them over time. How can we do that? What tools do we have in order to do that? And the answer came from somewhat unpredicted place. Um, I grew up in Israel and I grew up in Haifa, which is a city close to the Mediterranean Sea. And I used to spend most, on my, uh, most of my summers uh, at the beach. And at that time, there wasn't that awareness about the uh, danger for, from the sun, but one of my biggest enemies at that time were these large creatures that I remember seeing which looked like this, the jellyfish, right. So this is how I remember the jellyfish, but the, um, the other thing to be known about jellyfish, jellyfish have um, a, a protein and their gene, which is called a green fluorescent protein. So if you take these somewhat large and un ugly animals from the beach and you put them in the dark and you shine them with the light, they glow in the, in the dark. So they become these very beautiful creatures that can glow and can produce a green light in the dark. And what one can do is basically take that green gene from the jellyfish and put it anywhere you want and put it in any animal that's of interest. And so, for example, one can generate these very um, fascinating glow-in-the-dark animals. Right? These are basic animals in which the green protein was taken from a jellyfish and put in those animals and now these animals grow, glow in the dark. That's pretty remarkable and can be used maybe in the museum at, at some point. <laughs> 
But beyond that, what we can do as researchers, we can take a gene of interest and fuse the green protein from the jellyfish into the gene that we're studying. And now we can follow the behavior of each individual cell using this green marker. And this is exactly what we did. So let me introduce you to the gene that we are studying in my lab. The name of the gene is P53. And it's called the guardian of the genome. Why is that? Remember I told you that cells in our body are damaged, the DNA in, our, in the cells in our body is damaged all the time. And we get spontaneous breaks all the time. And then what happened is that the gene for P53 is activated. P53 comes up. And then P53 kinds of make a decision, right? If the damage is not too bad, it's not too severe, then it allows or it activates a repair pathway that then repair the damage and the cell can continue to grow. But if the damage is too severe, it's too bad, and if it does not repair because of some defect perhaps in the repair pathways, then P53 can activate other pathways that will either kill or arrest the damaged cells. Okay? So the way I like to think about it is that if, if cancer cells are the criminals, then P53 is the police, right? It's basically coming to catch those criminals to see how bad they are. Can we turn them into good citizens? And if not, to arrest them or in the case of cancer cells, to kill them, okay? And so um, clinicians, what clinicians are doing is they're using this principle in order to take cancer cells and to hit them with very high levels of DNA damage so that P53, that is, is still active in, in those cells will eventually kill them and by this can get rid of the cancer cells. So what we did, what we're doing in the lab is taking this P53, this police gene, and fusing it, connecting it with the green fluorescent protein and now we have a tool that we can follow how much P53 there is in each individual cell, individual cancer cell over time when we treat it with different drugs and when we irradiate the cells. And we create movies, basically movies like this movie that I'm gonna show you here. And uh, we're very used to look at those movies, but the, um, the one thing you need to take, what you see here, these are lung cancer cells. And the green color that you see in each individual cell, this is how much P53 each cell has. And I'm gonna run this movie, and what you'll see, these cells were treated with a very common chemotherapeutic drug you will see that the level of P53 go up, 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 up in each cell until the cells are dying. So this is a very, it's a very successful treatment for this particular cancer line. So here I'm going to run, and you see the cells become more and more and more green, and then they basically start to explode. And this is, this is a process called apoptosis, uh, programmed cell death or cell death. At the end of this movie, this is a, about a two-day movie, you see that all the cells in this particular tumor are dead. Great. P53 came and able to kill all the cells. Here's another example. These are breast cancer cells with the same technique. We're taking P53, infusing it to the green protein, and now we're irradiating those cells and we're trying to see what P53 is doing in those cells. So I'm going to run the movie and you'll see that Cells turn green, we're starting to see the green color, and then they disappear. Suddenly the green goes away. Then the green come back again and disappear again, right? There's a lot of information obviously in this movie because we're looking at many, many, many cells. But we can also see that some cells are doing different things from others, and it's very rich in dynamical information. So what we do from these movies, we take these movies and we calculate the amount of P53 in each individual cell in order to see how it changes over time. And one of the things that we discovered several years ago is that if we do it for this particular breast cancer line, irradiation leads to oscillations of P53. P53 levels go up and then down, up, down, up, down, right? If you think, if, again, about the connection between P53 as the policeman, that doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not really efficient to come to the scene and then leave it and then come again and leave it if you want to catch those criminals, okay? And the important thing to remember is that there's no way 
that one could capture or see these oscillations if you're looking at the collective behaviors of the cells because they're not synchronized between cells. And there's no way that one can capture it if you're looking at just one snapshot, obviously. Right? You have to follow each individual cell to catch these oscillations over time. Now, is this important? Does this make sense in terms of biology? Does it tell us anything about the way P53 functions? Recently, we found that the answer is yes. And I'm summarizing here um, a recent paper that came out from the lab in which we looked at the behavior of these oscillating cells, the cells that show oscillation of P53. And we realized that when P53 oscillate in those cancer cells, the cancer cells can escape the treatment. They actually recover and continue to grow. But if we irradiate them, and then combine it with another drug that eliminate the oscillations that basically lead to a non-oscillatory behavior of P53, what we call sustained P53, kind of keep the policeman in that site, then those cells enter what we call permanent arrest. They arrest forever and they stop growing. Okay? So just by doing a manipulation to the dynamics of P53, and just by seeing how cells behave individually over time, we now have new tools how to more efficiently lead cancer cells into permanent arrest. I want to give you another scientific example. Um, this is what we call survival curves. And those of you who have connections, have heard about pharmaceutical companies, this is what all pharmaceutical companies are doing and a lot of researchers are doing. Survival curves. You take a cancer line or tumor and you treat it with a drug and you treat and you titer the concentrations. You look at different concentrations. Without the drug, you start at one where all the cells are growing. The more drug you add, basically more and more cells are dying, right? And then researchers are calculating what is called the IC50, the concentration of the drug in which 50% of the cells are dead and 50% of the cells are alive, just by, again, measuring a collective one number. And we are saying, this is exactly when it gets interesting. That point, that 50% of the cells are dead and 50% are alive. Why? What's unique in those that survive the treatment at that particular point in time, at that particular concentration? And again, we can do the same trick. So here we're taking these are, uh, colon cancer cells in response to another drug which is commonly used in the clinic to treat colon cancer. P53, our same policeman, is fused to the green fluorescent protein. We're treating them, and we'll see that in all the cells, P53 levels go up. It goes up into very, very high levels. Some cells are dying, and you can see these white blurb at the top. These are dying cells. But the end of this movie, which is about a three day, we can follow these cells for three days under the microscope, we see many dead cells, but also many cells that survive the treatment, even though they have very high levels of P53. How is this possible? And this is done with the IC50, that, that um, uh, concentration that leads to 50% survival. And so if we follow P53 in each individual cell, we realize that the dynamics in dying cells is different from its dynamics in surviving cells. The red curves here represent the dying cells, and the green curve represent the surviving cells. And you'll see that the levels actually are somewhat similar. Surviving cells reach similar levels of P53 as dying cells. But what's the difference? They got there much later. It seems like there is a certain delay. And if P53 is expressed too little or too late, then those cells are already now, they are protected from the damage and they are surviving. So it's not just a matter of how much P53 each cell has, but it's also a matter of timing. When did it cross that level? If it's too late, then those cells are surviving. And so we are now very interested in understanding what is this protective mechanism that is happening in the background that allows these surviving cells to have so much P53 but still survive. Okay, so let me basically summarize the scientific part of, of this talk. What cancer cells don't want us to know. They don't want us to know that they're not all the same that they're very different, that they have very different behaviors. And for that, we need to look at the individual behavior of cells. And the second, 
is that, that their response can change, that they're very dynamic, and we need to measure their behavior over time at a high resolution. And some of you may wonder when I talk about all this, if looking at the response of individual cells over time is so insightful, as I hope I've convinced you by now, why not everyone are doing it, right? Why isn't this the, the approach that every lab that is studying cancer or any disease, why not everyone are doing it? And actually, for the answer for that, now I'm going to give you a snapshot that, that will be actually helpful. I want to give you a snapshot of my lab. So this is, it's not everyone, but almost everyone from my lab. Some members are missing. And now I want to give you a few examples for the, of the backgrounds of the people that are in my lab. So we have Julia, and she's a physicist, and Giorgio, who is a mathematician, and Kyle, who's coming from electrical engineering, and Ron, who is a computational biologist, and Caroline, or Tanya, and Andrew is coming from molecular biology, biochemistry, genomics, and medicine, and more fields. Our work, basically, in order to provide our work, requires integrations of different types of knowledge and skills. We need to do the imaging, the molecular biology. We need to understand uh, cancer. Then we need to take these movies that we are making and run them through image processing and image analyses to extract numbers from these movies. Then we get the trajectories, the dynamical behavior, and we need to write the modeling, mathematical modeling, that will help us suggest how much drug we need to add at and which time in order to change the dynamics. And we learn a lot from control theory, from electrical engineering when we do these experiments. So it's extremely, this is the whole idea of systems biology. Some of you have asked me, what does it mean? This is basically the whole idea, the integration of knowledge, a lot of quantitative work in order to understand medicine and basic biology. And in the last really couple of minutes, I want to kind of conclude that and bring that back into the woman aspect of the women-related uh, issue. Um, this is a quantitative field, and, and you see people coming from math and physics. And in many of the, you know, the more scientific quantitative fields, the percentage of women is extremely low. When I was offered the position at Harvard, there were 13 faculty in my department in systems biology, only one female, the rest were male. And, and there is a question that I keep asking myself all the time, and I think that we should all keep asking that and kind of increase the awareness, which is why are there still so few women in science? And again, especially in the more quantitative field, the, the STEM, the science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and I want to quickly share with you a personal story, which I think provide at least the answer for me. I think the answers could be very different uh, depending who you ask. But when I was offered that position, to join the Department of Systems Biology as an assistant professor. It was about almost nine years ago. Um, I was very excited. I was delighted. It was better than anything I could ever dream of. Um, but I was also terrified. I was really scared. And at the beginning, I thought, I'm really scared. I'm really afraid because I'm, I'm afraid of failure. I'm afraid that, that people are giving me all this money and all this space. They have really high expectations from me. What if I wouldn't make it? But then when I kind of look a little deep, I realize that my biggest fear is actually not the fear from failure. My biggest fear was that I'm actually going to be successful, but then in like five or ten years from now, I will look back and realize that I've paid too big of a price, that I've sacrificed too many things in life that are important for me just in order to be successful. Right, that I pay too big of a price in my, you know, mar my, my marriage or my kids, my family, my health, my happiness, and that price is just going to be too much if, whether I'm successful or not successful. And that was paralyzing. That was really, really terrifying. I was very uh, afraid, and especially because there weren't many or any role models to look at other women there that have done it and, and haven't compromised on the other things I wanted to have in life. And so at that point, I made a contract with myself. I made a contract that I'm going to continue. I'm going to accept the job. I'm going to start this lab. I'm going to do what I love doing and, and do in science. But if at any point I feel that I'm paying too big of a price or I'm feeling that I cannot do this together with all the things I value and think are important in life, then I'll move on and do something else. And I accepted the job, and here I am, 10 years from now, feeling like I can handle it, and I can do it, and not just um, with sacrifice, but with a lot of joy. But I do think that still, 
women are more prone to think about the impact of their professional career in other parts of their lives and whether the price they're paying is worth it. And um, you know, I'm putting here a picture of a baby in a suitcase, but it, it doesn't necessarily have to be related to kids. It's, it's related to anyone who wished to live you know, fulfilling life while having a very demanding career, it's academia and science and industry and, and so on. And so what can we do about it? And I'll give you um, one example of what I think can be done. Um, this year, there was a conference called the QBio, the Q Quantitative Biology Conference. It's a big conference in Hawaii. And um, after the conference was announced, then there was a blog, there is a very famous blog of a professor in UC Davies, Jonathan Eisen, it's called The Tree of Life. And in that blog, he wrote, maybe some of you have seen it, he said, the QBio conference in Hawaii, bring your surfboard and your Y chromosome because they don't take XX. And then he listed all the list of speakers and there was a 25 to 1 ratio, 25 males, 25 men, one woman. I was the one woman that was invited to speak in that conference. This is pathetic. This is embarrassing. Co correct. And so the organizers um, reacted to that and actually invited more women to speak in this conference and also invited me to be on the organizing committee for next year conference. Right now, we are standing in a 50-50%. 50 women, 50 men. Yes. <laughs> who are going to speak in this, um, in this conference. And I'm actually, my goal is to push it so there will be even more women than uh, next year. So I think this is what we can do. We can really, those who are in the more, in a, in a, in a more higher position or a bit more powerful position, this is the opportunity to serve as role model and to push more and more young women into, um, into higher positions in academia or in science in general. And as part of that, a couple years ago, I wrote this piece about how to survive and thrive in the Mother Mentor Marathon, being a mother and a mentor in academia, how one can combine the two worlds. And not just combine them. I think there is this notion sometimes that in order to be in academia, you need to suffer a little bit. You need to live some, a little uncomfortable life so that you'll be successful. I think some of the more senior people like the young people to believe this is true. And what I'm trying to say here that it's actually not the situation, that you can do both things with a lot of joy. And I want to just read the, the last part of this uh, article. So is it possible to thrive while combining motherhood and academia? Yes, I believe it is. I even believe that being a mother makes me a better mentor, and being a mentor makes me a better mother. I take the skills I learned from being a mother, patience, trust, and kindness, and use them in my work environment. And the example I provide to my kids as a working mother in academia helps them appreciate the importance of self-fulfillment and helps them believe in themselves and in their abilities. I truly believe that combining these two jobs enriches my life and makes me a more complete and satisfied person. And with this, I will conclude and thank you all for your attention. <laughs> And just a note that if you have questions, please write them on the cards that are on your tables. We'll collect them and give them to Dr. Lahav. Thank you. Okay. Um, let me start with uh, There is a question here. How have you done any research? Have you done any research? to look proactively how to prevent cancer cells from being treated? It's a great question. Um, definitely. So m I think many of the things that I describe uh, um, in this talk are related to already taking cancer cells and treating them with a drug. But we have a very active line of research in which we do exactly what's in this question. We basically take what we call primary cells, normal healthy cells, and we are trying to understand what happens actually when they become tumorigenic. Um, we're studying a new line of research and we, we use um, mouse models and we look at different organs. Some organs are more sensitive than others and we're trying to understand what happens in the process of developing malignant cancer with the same exact approaches. When we fuse the genes, 
that are important for preventing cancer into fluorescent protein and just following them even under what we call basal conditions, normal conditions. And so it's something that we are very interested in. In it definitely involved more working with uh, a bit more challenging cells, sometimes even stem cells or priming cells or animal models, but we are actively working in this um, direction. Um, the other question is an interesting question, more personal. Who was your strongest mentor who influenced your career path and why? Well, I love this question. Um, so th it's, it's, I think there are several people actually influenced my career path at different times, but I'm going to mention one of them. Um, his name is Uri Alon, and he is a professor at the Weizmann Institute. He's a physicist. And um, when I joined his lab, I joined his lab um, shortly after I finished my PhD. When I finished my PhD, I realized that it's, it's really important for me to work on something that is related to human disease. And I also was really, um, I love the quantitative aspect of science. I love physics and math and computer science. So I wanted a lab that combined these two things. And I found Uri, uh, who is an amazing scientist, but also a pretty a spectacular um, teacher and mentor. And Uri's lab did a lot of quantitative studies, um, but they worked in bacteria. This was, with main, this was their main work then. And I came to Uri and I said, I really want to work with you. I love the things that you're doing, but I don't want to work with bacteria. I want to work with human cells, and I want to study human disease and cancer. And Uri basically told me, welcome. Work on whatever you want. You have the freedom, the flexibility to choose your project, and I'll be here to support you. And that was what I think that was, to me, the best thing that could happen because he was an uh, amazing supportive mentor, but he let me work on what I wanted. Besides that, um, besides being a fantastic mentor, Uri is someone who very much believe in generating a nurturing environment for, for scientists, right? I mentioned a little bit that notion of um, suffering a little bit as a scientist. As a scientist, you want to think about science all the time. And so many young people, men and women, that have other things in life, they feel maybe I'm not good enough and I cannot be a scientist because sometimes I like not to think about science and I like to do other things. And, and with the, the things that we're trying to, to convey or the things that I've learned from Uri is that it's actually so important to be a more rounded person and to do many other things, whether it's related to having a family or just spending time with friends or going to the gym or just having fun so that when you think of science, your mind is much more open and fresh and able to, um, to go back to the lab and to find the answers. So, you know, I, I think his, his influence is, is with me all the time, actually, with everything that I do. Yes. Well, okay. <coughs> Does P53 respond differently to drugs in a Petri dish as opposed to being in the body? Very important, yes. Um, everything that I've described, you to, described to you today and all, all the stuff that we've done so far is what well called in vitro, in a dish. And, um, and very importantly, some things in a dish are very important than in the body. And so um, there is a recent study, not coming from my lab, but from a different group, that they develop a reporter for P53 in a mouse and irradiated the whole mouse, and they can see these oscillations of P53 in single cells in a mouse. So the one study that have done that. What we're doing now, as I mentioned earlier, we're also developing reporters to look at different organs in a mouse, and we're seeing very interesting behavior. We see that in some organs we see oscillations of P53, in some organs we don't see that. And that's already interesting for us to start to understand the differences between the probability of de developing cancer in these different organs and, and, again, how they can be treated. But, of course, we are translating and moving our research more and more into, into animals. <coughs> what advice do you give to other mentors, and why do you think you have been an effective mentor? Okay. <laughs> um, well, I think one important advice is to realize that the people that we work with are very um, different. Each, each person, um, and especially when working in an interdisciplinary environment, people are very different, and there's no one method of mentoring everyone. P53 
people need different things, people come with different skills, their personality is different, their background is different, the way the brain operates is different. And so one of the things that was very, it's very helpful for me is to listen to the people that I, I'm working with. Um, I mentioned in this piece that I've written, and I, I keep thinking that one of the advantages of being in academia is that we can choose who we want to work with. We choose kind of, we kind of choose our students and postdocs. And I choose people that when I come in the morning to the lab, I'm really happy to see them. I like them. I like them as, you know, as people. It's, it's crucial because you spend many hours and many years with them. And so they're not just talented and brilliant, but I really care about them and how are they doing. And so, and, and I learn a lot from them. You know, I have, you know, brilliant mathematicians in my lab who are much better in math than me, and I just learn from talking with them and listening to them. And also, I would never kind of give someone a project. We develop projects together so that people would feel like they own the project, that they came to these ideas themselves, and they really take ownership on what they're doing. And I think this is, this is important when mentoring a group. <coughs> How do you put the P53 in the cell of a person with cancer? Wow. Um, well, we probably don't want to put it in the body itself, but what we can do, and we're hoping to do, is to get tumor samples or like biopsies of, um, from patients. And then in the lab, we can manipulate these tumors in any way we want, the same way we do it in a dish. We can basically inject those cells with a P53 fluorescent, infect them with a P53 fluorescent protein, and then the dream is that we will be able to do that and to try different treatments and then to do more like the personalized medicine so that we can see for different tumors how P53 behave and what kind of treatment can um, be effective for each and every tumor. Again, we won't do it in the whole uh, body, but we will be able to isolate some tumors and then do some tests there. And how do you follow up with this after treatment? So that, I think the question is related to how do you follow up patients after treatment? Um, treatment seems successful, and, um, but there, there, are, there, there is important follow-up afterwards. Um, I think it's a little too early to answer that. I think we're just in the very early stages of understanding, in, in the early ages of trying to figure out the um, behavior, as I said, in an animal or, or a, human, a human body. Um, I'm not a physician, and so I'm not trying to come up with ideas on how to follow up after treatments, but I think it's a very, very important thing, uh, thing to think about and probably will be the follow-up of the kind of studies that we're doing in, in, the, net, you know, in the years to come. <coughs> what sparked your own interest in biology? When in your student life did it occur? Elementary, middle, high school, or college? Okay. Um, so I, I loved science from a very early age, and I, um, I think the loving of the, the different stages, but I think the early loving of science started in high school where I just had a wonderful teacher for biology, and I realized I'm fascinated by that. Um, at that time, and I said, I was also fascinated by physics, computer science, math, biology, medicine. I wasn't sure what, what to study, and I ended up to go into biology because there were no um, programs in systems biology then. And, um, and I'm also, I'm not one of those people who started studying biology kind of knowing exactly where I want to end, just, oh, one day I'll be a professor and I'm just going into that path. Kind of things took me into where I am right now without, without really a big goal. I think I was just planning the next step every time. Um, I mean, it was the right time to think about the next step. And again, as I said, during my postdoc life, I was really excited about that direction I'm pursuing and the, the independency I received just to pursue my interest. Yes. Okay. Um. <coughs> what advice would you give a 13-year-old girl who excels in science but doesn't promote herself in class like many boys do. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's a tough one. It's a tough one because I also I observe my kids. As I said, a boy and a girl, six years old, 
and I see the differences in the confidence and uh, in the um, in pushing and promoting and networking. Um, sometimes I, when I, I tell my kids that if you're shy, you're going to lose. You just those who are confident, they get so much more. And um, and I, I kind of I sometimes just literally tell them, just feel like you are jumping in, jumping into something with excitement, just kind of switching being nervous into jumping with, with excitement. And many times what I do is just relate to my own stories, how every time before I need to give a talk like this, I'm very nervous. And uh, every time I'm kind of jumping with joy to promote myself and to to voice myself. Um, one of the things that is very difficult to me is to see the many situations in which women at any age do not voice themselves. And I find myself in many meetings and committee meetings at Harvard with several senior guys and just me. And, um, and, and very actively needing to find a way to voice myself and to make sure I'm heard. Um, so I think for, for a 13 year old, 13 years old uh, girl, um, probably to show her, some, to provide some personal stories or to show some role models who have done it and, and succeed and are happy, that's, that's the best advice I could think of. Okay, and with this, I understand we need to conclude because of time. Okay, so again, thank you very much. Thank you.